Alan, are you there? Yeah. We made it, mate. We made it through 2020. I know. Only just mind. I thought it was easy. <laughs> Did you? Could have done it with your eyes closed. Yeah. Don't know. There were some moments in there for me. And we we re- tried really hard to destroy our careers by doing a podcast where we were a bit silly. There's plenty of time for that, though. I know. I know. Still got careers for now. So yeah. we've survived. It is 2021. This is the Deep Sea Podcast a punk take on a science podcast. I'm Dr. Thomas Lindley. With me, also surviving into the future, is Dr. Alan Jameson. You doing all right, mate? Yes, I'm fine. We made it. Cool, so let's get cracking. New year, fresh start. So I've still been thinking about the Deep Sea Mining episode and how complicated all that was. And it's just got me wondering about how we've impacted the Deep Sea, an area that we thought was beyond our reach and sort of immune to us. What are other good examples, Alan, of impacts we've had on the Deep Sea without maybe meaning to? There's loads. There's probably way more than people would think. I mean, there's a couple of really high-profile, really interesting ones. I mean, one of the, the more bizarre ones is uh, a big chunk of plutonium was jettisoned into the Tonga Trench, uh, but around 9,000 metres, which was a result of the Apollo 13 mission being aborted when they had to bring the, the lunar module back. It had the radioactive thermolytic generator still on it. So there's, there's, that's a weird one. The other big one was in the 70s, they dumped per volume the equivalent of 387,000 tons, which volume equivalent is about 880 Boeing 747s worth of pharmaceutical waste in the Puerto Rico trench. And that's probably the most ridiculous one I can find. It was only, it only happened for about five years, but it was a huge amount and, and banned it in like 1978. And as soon as they banned it, scientists went out and had a look and found that this antibiotic sludge was in fact toxic to most marine invertebrates. We talk a lot about the Mariana Trench because it's an easy one to just sort of get your head around and it's the deepest place. So in keeping with that thread, there has been more and more and more papers published in the last five years about pollution in the Mariana Trench. Now, this is not a, a dig at the Mariana or any of the nations around the Mariana. I think it just gets scrutinised more so because it's the deepest place in the world. It has that prestigious... There's traffic. Yeah. It's I think it, if you want to make a point, you do it at the deepest place. I mean, to, to tell people the third deepest place in the world has got something in it it shouldn't do is, is not that impactful. So it does get disproportionately scrutinised. But, you know, in the last four or four years, maybe there's been papers written about high concentrations of lead in the in the trench fish. There is the presence of the 1950s hydrogen bomb radiation and crustaceans at the bottom. There's been bioaccumulation of persistent organic pollutants. With that, it's, there, there are plasticizers, PCBs. There are flame retardants, PBDEs. More recently, there's a paper came out about the pesticides, DDTs. They're all present, uh, present in the, the deepest fauna. There is ingestion of microplastic and synthetic fibres. There's a paper describing lots of plastic litter on the seafloor. There's plastic contamination of sediments. It goes on and on and on. I mean, one of the, the weird things that came out of our expedition last year and the year before was the amount of fiber optic plastic coated umbilical cables that are strewn all across the Challenger Deep. Now, this is something that we don't see in other trenches. This is very specific. There's, there's so many people trying to crack this deepest place in the world. And unfortunately, some nations are taking to using a, a method which is really quite horrid in that they're, they're using a fiber optic cable to have real-time video communications to the surface. But at the end of that dive, they cut it. So it's like leaving fishing line trip wires, booby traps all over the bottom of the sea. And, you know, we've, we've come across it. We've, we've got a glimpse of it in 2019. There was some yellow stuff and there was some white stuff. And, you know, at one point the lander even landed on a, on a piece of this. And, and then the, the dives they did in 2020, it was clear that, especially on the western side, that it's, it's really, really bad. And it's a practice that we've, we've submitted a, an article to try and get that practice banned because it's, it's really awful. It's like trip wiring up the top of Mount Everest and, and unfortunately where our good friend Don Walsh dove in 1960 that's essentially now a no-go zone because you can't really go there now with an exploratory vehicle because the tangle hazards left over it's too dangerous so is this a site you've been to before and it's relatively new or have you just not been to this spot before and this might have been there for a while uh, we think it's we've got reason to believe it's probably in the last year or so which means so you've got a deliberate dumping of plastic and basically laying down tangle hazards. So once that particular group has done their dive, no one else can follow in their footsteps because they've left this big trail of, of fibre optic behind. And it's a bit sad that the exploration vehicles are not only stopping others coming in to look at the extent of the plastic problem, they're also adding to it which I think is really awful. But it is where it is, and it seems to be quite limited to Mariana Trench, and that suggests that it is because there's this sort of race on to try and get vehicles down there without necessarily caring about the impact that it has. So 
But there's also something else in the news last month was a paper came out about mercury contamination in the Mariana Trench and I was involved in this to some degree. Uh, there was actually two very similar papers. One came out of China and then there was there was our one came out which was, I won't take any credit for it, I just did the field work but it's really the work of uh, Joe Bloom and, and Jeff Raisin in, in the States. But what they were finding is that, I don't know if anyone's familiar with mercury but mercury is a globally distributed neurotoxic pollutant but it can be biomagnified in fish to levels that are actually harmful for human consumption. So it's something that we're very aware about in fisheries and perhaps not so appreciative of, of how it then percolates down to the deep sea but you know everything in the sea eventually sinks the only way is down and what they found in the study was the mercury isotope measurements of animals from the deepest trenches was basically full of surface ocean derived mercury and it had indeed infiltrated all the way down and that's really really sad so it's just another one I mean if you add that to the P PCBs the PBDEs the DDTs <laughs> it just it seems to be if you go looking for something you'll find it and you'll find it in the deepest place uh, which is really quite sad, but and that causes us issues because we don't have a baseline. When we're yeah, comparing yeah. places, we we need somewhere clean to compare them to, and nowhere is clean anymore. I think the take home message from all of this stuff is certainly some of those studies were came out of, of our lab. A lot of the questions we got were, well, what does it mean? What does it do? And so, well, we we don't actually know because we're only studying these species for the first time, and they're already contaminated. Therefore, the window in which to get some sort of pristine baseline data is now shut. So we'll never know. I mean, if, if these things are, for example, reducing reproduction success, we probably won't know because we won't know what the reproductive success was or what it's supposed to be. Yeah. And that's the most frightening thing. Then we'll talk a bit more about how we deal with new species that are already contaminated in a minute. But this paper is uh, was in the news, it got quite a lot of traction as well. And the day it went out, we got an email from a guy called Sam Ealingworth from the University of West Australia. And he's a senior lecturer in science communication and is also a poet. And he took the time, he was inspired enough to write a poem about the trench mercury contamination. We obviously went, ooh. We like a bit of art, actually. We're, we're we do. quite arty for a science podcast. So we emailed him and said, uh, can we read out your poem on our podcast? And he went one better and he recorded himself reading it out. So without further ado, here is Sam Ellingworth reading a poem called Mercury Sinking. Mercury Sinking. Spat out from the murky exhalations of our impetuous industry, you drift into the firmament, tainting its continents with your coarse and filthy touch trickling down ancient estuaries to nestle in the cool embrace of the approaching sea. Like rotten flotsam, you stray across the surf, swallowed whole by wide-eyed fish that dance beneath the waves, their bloated bellies imbued with the collective taint of our engorging toxins. After the dance, their bloated corpses fall through the water like dirty snow, pouring their poison into the creases of Gaia's deep and open wounds. Thanks for that, Sam. Thanks for letting us uh, play that on the show. Thanks. So anyway, in keeping with news at the start of the, each episode, and merging that together with uh, human impacts in the deep sea and plastics and everything else, there's a cool story in that Last year, just I think it was right just before lockdown, we put out a species description, you and I, and and it was first authored by Johanna Weston, who you heard on previous episodes. And we had teamed up with an advertising agency called BBDO Dusseldorf and WWF Germany to do this anti-marine plastic campaign. Tom and I found a species of hamphipod in the Mariana Trench on the Falkor in 2014, and it was a new species. And when WWF approached us and said, would you name a new species after the plastic found in its gut? I kind of reluctantly went, well, we don't know. There's a big, probably a high chance there is. And right enough, it did It did have plastic in its gut. It had PET, actually. And this amphibod's from between 6,010 and 6,949 metres deep. So this is a new species covered, already contaminated with plastic. And it was a species of what's called the Eurythenes, quite a big amphipod. And so we called it Eurythenes plasticus. And we handed it over to the advertising agency and they worked their magic. And just before Christmas, it's that time of year where there's lots of award ceremonies. Unbeknown to us, by the way, we didn't really have much to do with this, but I thought this was quite interesting. But over the course of the year, we had a PR company in London evaluate the campaign. And they calculated we had a reach of 1.4 billion people. And the campaign led to a WWF petition to end marine plastics. Uh, they managed to get 120,000 signatures. And... Over the first three months, there was at least 564 articles covering 93 countries. So this was a big deal. And, and, and this, it was just a little amphipod we found from Mariana, but it was, it's quite a big deal now. It's great to see how our work can impact and 
sort of reach the public consciousness because I'd I'd yeah. say you've done some some bigger, harder hitting studies in their findings. But it's just, you know, it's, it's a load of acronyms. It's a load of quite heavy scientific writing. It just doesn't engage the public like this did. It, it, it's, it's, such a, it's such a small thing to get your head around. You know, we've found something new and it's already dirty. It's already got contamination. We, we'll never know this animal clean. It's, a, it's quite impactful. And I think I think it was worth scientists teaming up with an advertising agency because you know they know how to get this stuff out there. Whereas you know we can put out a press release and hope it hope it sticks. So I mean, there's all sorts of things behind this. They also did a hologram of it, and that's it's now in a few museums. And there's, they did a completely CG 3D model of the amphipod, which is amazing. It's absolutely it's, it looks better than the real thing. And uh, and the exhibitions they put around the world. There's one in Smithsonian right now, and there's a few in Germany and, and other places. And they reckon there's close to half a million visitors have seen it so far. And the advertising equivalency value is estimated at 12 million euros so all this from just a one little laugh about from mariana the launch video is incredible i'll definitely put putting that on the show notes because yeah. it's it's really bear in mind that little amphipod is not real I'm, I'm i'm so in awe of the computer graphics guys for doing that they came to our lab and they we put one under a microscope and they took lots and lots and lots and lots of pictures of it and went away and reconstructed it and then brought it to life and there's a lot of moving parts on an amphipod like it's incredible yeah. how they've articulated every part of this model. So the whole thing's a great success though. We published the paper in Zootaxa and it's all good. It's now on the record and I thought we made that impact and we did our bit for marine plastics and we did our bit to show the, the bad side of human impacts in the deep sea and plus we got a bit of science out of it and it's all good. But then we threw all that out the window because it was award season. <laughs> <laughs> it's the time to scoop up the golds. So anyway, so just before Christmas, there was the Euro Best Awards for Creative and Effective Branded Communications in Europe. It's quite a big deal. And Eurythenus Plasticus won the Grand Prix for good. And it won a gold for PR corporate purpose and social responsibility. It won a gold for integrated campaign. It won a silver for brand activation and corporate purpose and social responsibility. It won a silver for integrated campaign led by PR. It won a silver for direct corporate purpose and social responsibility. And a bronze for the media use of stunts. And I have no idea what the stunts were. Oh, jeez. But we won a bronze for use of stunts. I don't remember jumping out of a glass window <laughs> or any commando rolling at any point. Anyway, in the next one, the, the Epica Awards, which is for an award for creativity judged by the press. We got a gold award for public interest environmental, a gold award for native advertising and a bronze award for public relations so there you go wow. big success and all because of a little deep sea amphibod that's a huge impact that's really good that's just so far oh i'm sure there's more i'm sure there's more i'm sure there's an oscar for amphipods i'm sure that the important message we're trying to get across to the world is is very important of course but you know show me the gold <laughs> that was a sample that me and you got back in 2014 yeah which was described by taxonomy machine johanna weston yes good stuff it just goes to show what you can do get a good science a good advertising agency and something as big as the wwf and it can have a huge impact i mean massive and you get gold at the end and silvers and bronzes i feel like you're already drunk on that you're already drunk on the the awards well i like the fact we won the grand prix for good that deep sea amphipod wins the Grand Prix. Fact. Brilliant. And we've seen loads of art inspired by it as well, haven't we? Keeping the it's art been loads going. Of art. Yeah, it's loads. Yeah. Some really nice sort of illustrations and then some sculptures as well. There was a sculpture made out of plastic, wasn't there? Yeah, there was also an animation of plastic is made out of plastic and stuff like that. There's been quite a few of them. I haven't it's been so widespread and mad that I haven't actually managed to sort of compile a, a list of it. Now it's just got a life of its own. Every now and again you get an email from someone going, Oh, I've drew a picture of your plasticus. And they're like, All right. And then somewhere in there it's like, Yeah, and it's in an exhibition somewhere. And you're like, Oh, okay, that's just not somebody playing around at home. It's actually a proper artist. I thought it was a cool thing to do, but I never thought it would have that sort of impact. So when discussing human impacts in the deep sea, there's two different things. I mean, a lot of these ones I've just read out about the PCBs and flame retardants and then pesticides. These are not deliberate. These are not people going out on barges and throwing stuff in. I mean, the pharmaceutical waste thing is. And when we talked about deep sea mining on the previous episode, I mean, that's obviously deliberate. There's an ethical argument about whether you deliberately make an impact. It feels different when you, you decide to do something, even if you decide it's the it's the least bad of multiple bad options. So the story I want to tell is a hypothetical story. It's a, it's, a, it's a real story that did emerge a few years back, but I think it's over the years has prompted a good amount of discussion. And I, I think it's worth a year because it's not real. I got an email from a, a guy in New Zealand called Steve. He was a retired energy analyst, and he sent me an idea to think about. And he was literally just like, here's an idea, go and think about it. Uh, and I like that kind of approach. And at this point in time, there was a lot going on about scavenging CO2 from power plants and liquidizing it, pumping it underground or into spent oil wells, basically trying to get rid of it, trying to keep it out of the environment. But Steve had calculated that if liquid CO2 were pumped to the bottom of a hadal trench, it would be 7% more dense than the ambient seawater 
and therefore would permanently remain as a lake of liquid CO2. And it would, because of the pressure, it would probably become a hydrate. Thus, if you could scavenge the CO2 from land, pump it down to the bottom of the sea, it would form a hydrate, which is basically, it turns solid. And then it can't get out. It can't get out as long as the sea is there, right? Are you with me, Tom? Yeah, and it, it did lots of calculations about sort of how stable it would be, because our, our immediate thought was like, oh yeah, but then there's an earthquake and it all comes out at once. But it, it's super stable once it's in that state, isn't it? Yeah, there's some holes in the whole idea of how you get it down there in the first place, right? So, but this is a hypothetical question. So he first writes to me and says, well, what happens if we were to like, let's take Challenger Deep, for example, why don't we just fill Challenger Deep and just turn it into this great big huge CO2 block? You know, how would you feel about that? I'm like, if I remember right, I think I turned it around on him and said, well, you're from New Zealand, so what if we just dumped it all on the North Island of New Zealand? It's an environmental disaster in a very small part of the planet. It doesn't mean to say people are going to get behind it, but that's what you're suggesting. Will willfully destroying anywhere in the sea doesn't appear to be a good idea. But then we got talking more. So my first thing was that perhaps he thought that the hail is almost another lifeless barren place as everyone else does, and because everyone thinks they're alien-like creatures, then you might as well sacrifice them for the greater good of the nice animals. But then I persevered with him, and he was a really nice guy, and we kept talking, and he suddenly swung it the other way, right? So we were talking about wantingly destroying big chunks of the deep sea. The idea suddenly goes from crackpot idea to one that perhaps makes a lot of sense if it was logistically possible, which I think right now it isn't. But he calculated that a depth more than 6,000 metres, there's a hole, there's a deep in the Java Trench, for example, of Indonesia, that when you look on Google Earth, it's a pinprick, right? It's not big. But in that deep bit, you could accommodate 19,000 gigatons of liquid CO2, which is greater than the CO2 yield from all currently known global fossil fuel reserves. This is just one trench out of many, many. He pointed out that China has the largest demand for CO2 storage from power generation and industrial sources, which by 2050 could be as much as 3 gigatons a year. But he calculated that there's a trench off Japan, called the Rikuyu Trench. It has two basins deeper than 7,000 metres, and those depressions have the capacity to store all the CO2 captured in China at 3 gigatons per year for over 200 years. So, right, so I started using this in some tutorials and stuff to sort of put the idea out because it does seem like a horrendously stupid thing to do. I mean, obviously the best thing is just not produce CO2 in the first place, but... The gut feeling is revulsion. The gut feeling is like, you can't do that. But then once you actually see the, see the balance, see the decision you're mm. making, like, it, gosh, it, if it would fix climate change... One of the big things that, that's freaking me out and, and the reason why I'm, I'm maybe sort of at least open to deep sea mining if it means we get away from carbon is the biggest threat to the deep sea at the moment, even though we talk about all these impacts, is climate change. Yeah. If those currents that are delivering oxygen to the deep sea stop, the, the whole deep sea suffocates. And that sounds dramatic, but it's happened. In the, in the Metazoic era, that was how the deep sea was. That's why we have oil because things weren't rotting because there was no oxygen down there. So the fact that the deep sea could just die, the whole thing, <laughs> you know, sacrificing yeah. a tiny amount of it to fix that problem. I don't like it, but I, I'm, you know, I'd at least consider it. This liquid CO2 turning to hydrate thing is an element of sci-fi anxiety in there. Cause like, what happens if something goes wrong and it all comes back up and you've got this mega bubble of CO2 that stuff, you know, and all that kind of stuff. So I said, okay, let's go back to the, the foundations of the question, right? So we turn it around and say, what would happen if you could take every bit of plastic out of the ocean and dump it all on New Zealand? I'm just using New Zealand because it's an island. It would be an absolutely devastating thing for New Zealand, but would we be willing to sacrifice something like that for the greater good of the other 99.9% .9 of the planet? It becomes quite interesting after that, doesn't it? Well, interesting or troubling. Yeah. You, you know I get myself tied all, into not Just dump it all in the deepest point in the med. Although I'm not sure the med's deep enough. I think it had to be over 6,000 or over 7,000 metres for it to really turn to hydrate. Oh, and I wonder if med being weirdly warm is another one. We'll talk about the med in a bit. It was, actually. I think the last conversation I had with him, he was looking at potential sites for European CO2 storage, and I think he had not factored in that the Mediterranean was so warm. And we kind of lost touch after that. I don't, I don't know what happened there, but I, I don't know. It, it, it's not something that's ever going to happen, but I think it, it poses some really interesting questions about human impacts to the deep sea. It's like, it's not having a blanket, no, we should never do it, isn't necessarily that useful. There may be ways in which it can be done that come with great moral dilemmas, but for the greater good. Do you know where the deepest place in the Mediterranean is, Tom? I do. I do. I know it fairly well. When were you there? I was there in, gosh, it might have been a while ago now. Gonna make me get the paper up. Anyway, early early teens, two thousand teens, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, so okay, the deepest point in the Mediterranean is Calypso Deep. Couldn't really f figure out why it's called Calypso Deep. I, I I just figured it was because Jacques Cousteau used to work in the Oceanographic Museum in Monaco, and his submersible was called Calypso. But there was actually a HMS Calypso that did a lot of oh. work. So I'm not sure what that relationship is. It's, it must come from one of the two of them. 
it's the deepest point in the Med. It's just uh, west of Greece, west of Peloponnese, 5,100 metres. It's right next to a, um, a little town of Pilos, isn't it? Yes, the lovely little town. <laughs> Spent a fair bit of time there. And there were some interesting projects, because it's so close to land, to look at actually putting cabled observatories down there. And I think there is some test some test sites around there as well, isn't there? Yeah. My experience of Calypso Deep is there. I was there in 2006 and did a bioluminescence profile from the surface to over 5,000 metres in a Force 8. Which is rare. That's a bit of a heavy night, that. It's usually pretty quiet. Yeah, it was weird, yeah, because we came out the Adriatic and we're thinking all we have to do now is just cruise into Heraklion. Easy peasy. Never thought in a million years that that part of the world would end up in a Force 8 storm. But anyway, we did it. So I've done the water column. You did the bottom, but it landed, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, I think we were the first pictures, was it, of over 5,000 metres at the deepest point in the med? Possibly, yeah. It might be. Uh, that paper's open access, so I'll, I'll stick it in the show notes if anyone wants to read. Uh, nice pictures of some sharks and fish and critters. But the weird thing was there was only two species present at the very bottom. It was a, a shrimp and macrurid, a rat tail. But they both seem to be stunted to this same sort of size. They both seem to be about 10 centimetres long. The food supply is incredibly low down there, so we were wondering if there's like a an energy optimum for them down there. There's weird stuff going on in the Med. I reckon it's one of the most metal seas. It's one of the most awesome seas because of its interesting history and how it's still interesting today. It's a fairly new sea. It wasn't there for a while. It actually completely dried out six million years ago in the Messian salinity crisis. So completely dried out. They reckon a few little pools may have survived so we might have some endemic species surviving but basically it had a a hard reset six million years ago when it pretty much completely dried out it eventually reconnected with the atlantic about 5.3 million years ago in the sanclean flood or the sanclean deluge this is just incredibly awesome the water is dropping well more than a kilometer 100 million meters squared per second is flowing into this And over a couple of years, the whole sea filled through this one entrance in the Atlantic. So that just must have been incredible. Like if you could stand on the shores and watch that happening, it must have been amazing. Uh, Some geologists think it was slightly less spectacular and it maybe happened over a longer time. But I'm team one kilometre enormous waterfall. Sounds a bit more awesome. And that was flowing in through the Strait of Gibraltar. Again, adds some strangeness to the um, to the Med. So that's a narrow channel. It's deepest at about 280 metres deep. And so that means that the deep sea species that colonise the med have to, at some point in their life, cope with being that shallow, like either as a larval stage or a juvenile stage or floating eggs or something like that. And so that means that the deep sea fauna that have seeded the med are sort of restricted by that. And you don't get the usual deep sea sort of classics. You don't get your deep sea anglerfish, for instance, and there's a lot of crustaceans missing as well. So you end up with a slightly unusual deep sea community there. It also ends up being really warm. So usually abyssal water depth is two to four degrees centigrade. So it's actually quite cold. But in the med, it's 13 to 14 degrees, like right the way down. There's not a, there's not a thermocline. So it's warm water all the way down. And that makes it a little bit easier for shallow species to go a little bit deeper. So not only do you see a subset of the deep sea fauna from the Atlantic getting into the med, you also see shallow species going a lot deeper because pressure and temperature are kind of all intertwined together. So you you see the the reverse in, say, the Norwegian fjords, where really cold water means that deep sea species come a little bit shallower. Interestingly, they start to evolve as well. So you end up with deep water variants of classically shallow water species. I'm really interested in these sort of warm deep waters just because they almost act like an experiment to show us the limits of life and what is restricting animals getting where. That high temperature really accelerates metabolism and that includes like microbial metabolism as well. So the food that's usually feeding the deep sea, things that are produced on the surface through you know whole animals dying and sinking down or through uh, phytoplankton, that gets broken down by bacteria much, much faster. And so actually at the very deepest point when we first got those images, it looks like a, a really good plaster job. It's perfectly, perfectly smooth and clean and it's hard to imagine where these animals are finding any food down there because it, it looks polished. It's really strange. What we need to do to try and tie together the Mediterranean and the plastics and the deepest point in the Mediterranean, we need to find someone who's been there. Yeah, someone who's seen it firsthand. Yeah. This is what you're supposed to ask me. Do you, do you know someone? I say, yeah. <laughs> do you know anyone who's seen the, the bottom of the med firsthand, Alan? Yeah, I think I do. Do you want someone who's been to the deepest point and seen a lot of plastic? Yes, that would be interesting. That would tie into our sort of human impact theme for this episode. Is there any just like a bow you could put on this though? Because those those are really important things. But is there any just final fact about this person that would just 
just really make it that little extra bit interesting, that little bit well, more Well, because unusual. it's the first episode of the new year, do you, do you want it to be someone royal? Yeah. Yeah, if you can do that. All right. Yeah. Okay, so someone who's been to the bottom of the Mediterranean Sea, someone who's yep. observed marine plastic and litter there. And yeah, yep. yeah, if it can be a member of the royal family, that would just be super. Okay, I, I'll just go and get the phone. All right, I'll be back in a sec. On this episode of the Deep Sea Podcast, we have the honour of welcoming our next guest, who is an important advocate of environmentalism and ocean conservation. And among many other global initiatives, uh, we've had the pleasure of hosting here in Newcastle two years ago when he received a, an honorary lifetime membership to the Challenger Society. And who also this year, earlier this year, he joined us in the world of deep diving submersibles. So joining us from Monaco, please welcome His Serene Highness Prince Albert II of Monaco. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure. I mentioned that the, the deep diving submersible there. Uh, my first question is, you know, earlier this year, you recently you, d- you dove to over 5,000 meters in the Mediterranean Sea in, in the limiting factor submarine yeah. to the deepest point, no less. And you saw firsthand the current state of the sea floor. Could you tell us a bit about your experience of being in the sub generally and exactly what it was that you, you saw on the seafloor? It, it was an incredible experience. And uh, to be in uh, the DSV limiting factor, which is a, an incredible craft and uh, not uh, by, by the excess of, of space that we have in, in the capsule, but, <laughs> but it's a it's an incredibly efficient vessel and, and uh, felt very safe at this vessel. And, and, and we were able to, to have a very smooth uh, descent and, and then uh, ascent back up to the surface. But uh, to, to be there with with Victor Vescoval and, and of course, with the whole team that was a, was a just a great experience and and just seeing the, the well the complexity of putting on such an operation and also knowing that uh, you you are diving in the, the deepest part of the Mediterranean which uh, of course is a sea that's very close to my heart close to everybody here in Monaco living on its shores but to to see the what we could through the little the very small portholes gives one a very good impression of what what oceans and seas are all about Mm -hmm. the difficulties and the fragility of of these ecosystems but of course what was the most striking is that well we saw very very little life outside but a few uh, deep water shrimps but quite a lot of plastic yeah and that was the, the the most frightening and and surprising thing is that right on the on the floor of the Mediterranean at, at over 5,000 meters, well, there's large quantities of pieces of plastic. And so that uh, only goes to show that if if need be, we, we, we all, I think, knew about this, but the extraordinary amount of plastic litter that is in our seas and our oceans, and, and we absolutely have to try to curb this ever-increasing volume of plastic waste that we dump into our oceans every year yeah i mean i've i've I watched the videos back and uh from mm. from your dive and it is i would say out of everywhere we've been that was by by orders of magnitude the worst in terms of just really? just the, the ratio between litter and life it was it was virtually nothing there was, i don't recall actually seeing any any animals on the seafloor at all during the whole dive it was just all litter of of every type you can think of so I mean, recently you founded the Beyond Plastic Med Initiative. So for the benefit of the audiences, can you explain what that is and how you can get people involved? Plastic pollution is obviously one of the most serious ecological problems that uh, that we are facing affecting our, our oceans. And this was especially true in the Mediterranean. And it's especially true because it is a semi-enclosed sea. And it's now unfortunately considered, as, as you just said, now, one of the most polluted seas in the world. So in order to, to meet that this challenge of trying to find the best solutions uh, for plastic in the Mediterranean, my foundation partnered with the Terra Ocean Foundation, uh, Surf Rider Europe, and the, and the MAVA Foundation in privileged partnership with IUCN to create this initiative called Beyond Plastic Med or BMED five years ago. Mm-hmm. So each year, BMED supports initiatives that aim to reduce plastic pollution at its source. So for the last five years, we've been involved in 57 different projects in 15 countries that are around the Mediterranean. And so beyond the financial support, BMED creates a, a regional dynamic by facilitating the sharing of experience and knowledge within this network. And to reinforce its impact, BMED also works with the private sector and uh, earlier th- this year, a business club for companies operating around the Mediterranean was created. The discussion space, supervised by a small committee of experts, supported companies to implement different solutions and, of course, sustainable solutions. 
So until b- beginning of next January, BMED fifth call for microinitiatives is open. So the call is aimed to support projects to find alternatives to, to plastics, to mobilize the different stakeholders, uh, to collect data, and to advise and help and implement uh, new regulations that raise awareness and to improve the actions of uh, waste collection. Uh, so everybody has a role to play in, in this BMED initiative on the political front to try to implement new regulations to make this effort a more globalized effort, if you like, to really get NGOs involved to, to disseminate best practices and and mobilize the different stakeholders. The industrial sector also need to be involved to reduce the use of plastics and to reduce plastic production. And of course, the scientific community and scientists and engineers to to develop new materials to improve plastic waste management. Then last point is, is, is the public at large, that we all should reduce our use of plastics in everyday life. I think you make an important point there about thinking sort of environmentally about the Mediterranean. And this is not necessarily a, a, an effect of the countries around the Mediterranean being particularly wasteful or, or reckless. I think that you have to appreciate that the Mediterranean is a very, very deep basin, which is there's no potential for dispersal because it's, it's mm-hmm. so locked together that anything that goes in the Mediterranean stays in the Mediterranean. And when you get down to the deepest point, which is Calypso Deep, it's... There's yeah. nowhere else for it to go. So it's quite unique in that if it were to go off the the coast of Portugal, for example, literally would ultimately spread across the Atlantic and perhaps it wouldn't feel so so bad. But the Mediterranean, is, is it, there's nowhere for it to go. And that's that's a really sad state of affairs for the, the species that, that, that live there. <laughs> you know, it's mm-hmm. essentially this ultimate sink for it. Go back to this with your BMED hat on and your mm-hmm. opportunity to dive in the sub. Do you think that actually being on the bottom do you feel that being there in person gave you a sort of new perspective or, or some new sort of inspiration to do something because i know it's, it's one thing seeing pictures in magazines of litter on the sea floor or videos on yeah. tv but to actually sort of see it with your own eyes do you think that's made an impact on you no no of course i have been privileged to travel to many places around the world and many different beautiful places and on different oceans and to do some dives, not not dives in in a in a capsule like that, but to uh, uh, some bottle diving, but to go deeper below the surface, but to actually go to the very bottom of one of the seas and the Mediterranean in particular, and and to see the extent of plastic uh, litter and, and and the impact that this plastic has on the different depths of our oceans is, is of course a wake up call and. I was expecting to see something along along the way, but not not so many different pieces of plastic on the ocean floor. Yeah. That should be a wake up call, not only for me but for anybody. It's, it's, I think, especially when you got the visual imagery of of what people expect to see when they're stood on the coast of the Mediterranean. You know, it's this hot, beautiful yeah. beaches, holiday resorts, and and then suddenly you realise, you know, because I've, I've done a few ROV projects in the Mediterranean as well, and it's mm-hmm. it's it is staggering. We we've seen corals with we've been wrapped in rope and you know yeah. drinks cans and amongst coral reefs and stuff like that. It's 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 tragic, and I think maybe people who are lying on the sun liners on the beaches of the, you know, the Mediterranean probably don't really have an appreciation for just how bad the Mediterranean is becoming and how quickly it's becoming really bad. No, it's true. And that's why it's so important. It's more important than ever now, having seen this, that I try to do my part into, into trying to mobilize people around these this issue that's that's so important for our well-being. If there are healthy ecosystems and, and a healthy global ocean, then we will, of course, benefit from that. We have to be made aware of this and we have to let the public at large know about this. and They can play a role as well. So the, the plastic problem, I think, is, is ultimately extraordinarily important, but you can get very depressed thinking about it because <laughs> it's so... It's, I think even just last week, there was a news report I read about the plastic pollution at the very summit of Mount Everest, which, to be honest, is not too surprising, but it's just sad to see yeah. it in black and white that, you know, you're now looking at every corner of the planet. So to try and lighten the mood a little bit, we spoke to Don Walsh quite a lot, and Don's been telling oh, yeah. us about some of the other guys that were involved in Trieste that perhaps you've never normally heard of. And over the course of my career, certainly, your great-grandfather has come up time and time and time again through species that have been named after some of his vessels, through things like he pioneered to deep baited trap. He, he did this huge haul of what we call parasitic eels and, and stuff like that. So I just wanted to take the opportunity to ask you about his Serene Highness Prince Albert I. You know, he's clearly a legend in the deep sea world. And it was obviously yeah. 100 years ago. 
I was wondering if you could just tell us what he was like. I know he was called a navigator prince and you hear about all these amazing expeditions that he did, but what motivated him? What, what, what kind of person was he? Well, I, I'm sorry that uh, neither my father or, or myself got to know him personally because he passed away uh, well before my time and, and just before my father's time. But but just reading his uh, journal and reading his book and reading his different letters that he wrote, different speeches or presentations that he made to fellow adventurers or scientists, an incredible curious mind in, in, in the good sense of the term, you know, to, he was really wanting to know everything about oceanography of course, but also other sciences. He took a great interest in anthropology and in a whole array of different sciences. But uh, really, his his love for the sea and his sense of adventure, but also his great vision of what uh, needed to be done, even in, in his day. Also, meteorology. He was instrumental in, in establishing the, the, the first uh, weather station in the Azores in the latter part of the 19th century. So he was a pioneer, of course, and, and he was very much at the forefront, as you know, of, of greater dissemination of the, the, the then new science of oceanography at the time through his connections with different scientists around the world and through the, some 28 different expeditions that he organized and that he funded and that he helped set up. Well, all of that really makes him a, an incredible pioneer and, and really an incredible visionary of uh, way before most people started talking about the need to protect the humans, the need to protect different species. Well, in several different letters and, and, and speeches that he wrote in the very early part of the 20th century, I think it was 1903, he was talking about issues concerning overfishing in, in certain parts of the Atlantic. No one, of course, ever talked about that yeah. at, at that time. And uh, some people still have problems with that now, but it took a long time for many of us to realize that oceans were overfished or that this could be a problem down the road. But he, he saw that back then. And so um, it, his legacy is tremendous. And I think it's always incredible to think that, that uh, even if he died almost 100 years ago, that his legacy still lives on and has still inspired uh, many people around the world and many, and many scientists are, yeah. who love the ocean and through the Oceanographic Museum in Monaco and, and its collections and its, all, all, all the information that it can disseminate. But through through his personality as well, that, that then can be perceived through his, through his films and through his, uh, and through his writings. I think one of my favourite stories was, uh, which is a moment of incredible simplicity, but at the time must have been visionary, was when he went out to the North Atlantic and he wanted to map the Gulf Stream. So apparently over the course of multiple expeditions, they threw over 1,600 wine bottles over the side with a letter in it. And they did the yeah. message in the bottle thing. And then there was people in Orkney yeah, yeah. and Shetland finding these things like months later and <laughs> opening them up and finding a letter from Prince Albert of Monaco inside. <laughs> it must have been really bizarre. And of course he's asking them to, would you politely write back to me and tell me where you found this? <laughs> and, and there's an amazing map drawn of essentially the North Atlantic circulation from that. Yeah. So uh, I wonder what he would have made of the plastic problem. That would have been an interesting conversation. Uh, yeah, I, I would have loved to have picked his mind about that, but I'm, yeah. I'm sure he, he would be appalled by it and definitely uh, try to mobilize people around this. So what do you think, is what, what's the next big step then in deep sea conservation, particularly in the Mediterranean and in, in your, your backyard? A societal one? Is it a technology one? Is it a problem for scientists to deal with? Is it, a, or, is it or, or is it entirely a political one? I mean, how, how the plastic problem seems now that it's so huge, it's hard to know yeah. who to go to to fix it. Well, you know, I think it obviously is a mixture of all of the above. I think that the technology is available to us now it is already very substantial and, and that we can draw from that to help us. And so do the scientific skills to, to operate the, these technologies. First of all, identify the problem and then, and then try to find substitutes for plastic. But I think what is lacking also is financial resources uh, so that scientists can, can work in good conditions. Of course, there's also the political will to take the brave measures at the multilateral level to better preserve different parts of the global ocean. The different different actions at different levels, they all have to converge to make all these uh, things possible to better protect our seas and, and the ocean floor. It's great that you've got things like Beyond Plastic Med initiative and stuff like that. So it's great to know that there are big voices, at least in the Mediterranean, trying to do something about that. And I think that's 
probably the take home message is what's happened is bad but there are good things taking place yeah. to try and undo it all so with that I would just want to thank you Serene Highness for your, your time this afternoon thank you I wish you all the best and I encourage all our listeners to go out and check out the Beyond Plastic Med initiative as well and see if there's anything they can do to, to join in and help absolutely thank you so much so that was uh, His Serene Highness Prince Albert II of Monaco. So thanks very much for him to take the time out to speak to us today. That's most fascinating stuff. And whilst we were preparing for this episode, I was looking up things particularly to do with uh, Prince Albert I of Monaco, because obviously, as I explained to the prince, he was quite an influential guy. And we're also, as part of the podcast, we're looking into the origins of some key species names. And actually, there's a really nice one that ties into that. And the more I looked into this and the more I started jotting down notes, the more I realised that it creates this really interesting story involving Monaco species names, Tonga, plastics, and an unbelievable number of Scottish people and Scottish inventions and time travel. So so I, I, this might be a time, Tom, to go and get yourself a cup of tea and sit back and just listen to me spinning a good yarn. Yeah, we go, we're going on a journey. I mean, I have to acknowledge that there's probably glaring emissions in this whole story and it's very biased towards certain things. I just find it quite interesting and it wraps up a lot of things that we've talked about in other episodes as well. There's a lot going on here. It's probably best I just take a deep breath and go for it. Go on. So there are all sorts of connections between some of the names we use on a daily basis in our business and Prince Albert I of Monaco. For example, we work a lot with amphipods and they're a very important part of the deep sea community, particularly in the scavenging guild. Uh, and they're major players in the trenches. And in fact, the majority of the human impacts uh, that we just explained earlier in the episode from the Mariana Trench have actually come from the analysis of amphipod samples, and in particular one called Hirondelia. And in Mariana Trench, that species is called Hirondelia gigas, so the genus is Hirondelia. And we've also mentioned in the episodes before uh, a few times the supergiant amphipod, and it's of the genus Alicella, of the family Alicellidae. That also includes the Paralicella, which are also very prominent in Abyssal and Hale communities. So if you look at the first name, Hirondelia, that entire family was named after Prince Albert I of Monaco's ship, which was called the Hirondelle, later the Hirondelle II. So the Hirondelle derives from the bird family of swallows. So he apparently pioneered the baited trap, which we use quite a lot in the deep sea, which was uh, likely to be the device that caught the first new species of amphipod. So it became the Hirondelia, named after his ship, which is named after swallows. And that was back in 1887, and published in 1889 by Chevrolet. So we owe the name of the most prolific hadal amphipod to Prince Albert I of Monaco. And then there's the super giants. These are these amphipods which are unbelievably huge, called alicellids. We owe this name indirectly to a Scottish person. So Prince Albert I's wife was Lady Mary Victoria Hamilton of Lanarkshire in Scotland. They married in 1869, and while he was off fighting in the Franco-Prussian War, she decided that, quote, disliked Monaco and everything Mediterranean. So then she returned to Hamilton, which seems a bit of a strange decision. But I mean, I guess some people say that Hamilton is the Monte Carlo of Lanarkshire. I'm pretty sure that's on the merch. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's on the merch. So anyway, Prince Albert I went on to marry someone called Alice, hence the Princess Alice which became the name of a replacement vessel for the Hirondelle. So he started doing all this deep sea work and all his expeditions on the Princess Alice, which in turn gave name to the Alicella, which in 1899 was described again by Chevreau. So there was the first species, and the first species of Alicella, believe it or not, was actually the supergiant. And it came from 5,285 metres in the North Atlantic on the Madeira Abyssal Plain. So there you go. So if Lady Mary from Hamilton had stuck out in Monte Carlo a bit longer, the supergiant would have been called something else. But weirdly, the Princess Alice legacy goes on because in 1901, it was the Princess Alice that first proved unequivocally that the multicellular organisms were alive and well at Hadal Depths because they were the first to pull up urchins, sea stars, brittle stars and fish from 6,035 metres in the Atlantic, which was very contrary to the popular perception at the time. So his legacy and that of his expedition goes even further and seems to get strangely embroiled in Scotland again. For example, his early expeditions focused on tracking the Gulf Stream and I mentioned this to Prince Albert II. And this is where he would just throw these bottles off in various places, and I think 1600 then went off in the Atlantic with a note in it saying, whoever finds these, will you please send them back? And it was it was in the Scottish Geographical magazine that put a note out that said, uh, quote, it will be interesting to follow the history of these messengers from the sea, and any of our readers who may spend their time on the west coast of Scotland or outlying islands would do well to look out for these monocle floats, which I thought was a great way of doing science. Uh, and right enough, his findings were then published in the Scottish Geographical Journal in 1892, having had his bottles recovered from the shores of the Scottish Western Isles and Orkney and Shetland and Norway and Iceland and everywhere else. Pretty groundbreaking stuff. He also bizarrely deployed a light box filled with light-sensitive paper to examine the penetration of sunlight in the deep sea. Pretty revolutionary stuff at the time. So right, let's make everything get even more complicated and weirder. 
Later on, he became interested in the polar regions and he hooked up with another Scottish guy called William Spears Bruce. And he even supported Bruce's Scottish National Antarctic Expedition in 1902. And this guy went down there on the Scotia. Sailing from Glasgow in 1902, he gave a name to a big chunk of Antarctica, with the area we know as the Scotia Arc. So that's all Scottish and Prince Albert tied in. And then Prince Albert took Princess Alice up to Svalbard on four occasions, and four big expeditions that culminated in a big area of Spitsbergen and being named Prince Albert Land. Uh, and at the turn of the century, he actually visited Scotland many times and gave lectures in universities of Glasgow and Edinburgh. Back home, though, he founded the Oceanographic Institute in 1906, which includes the Oceanographic Museum and Aquarium in Monaco. And in 1919, Prince Albert offered to host what has now become the International Hydrographic Organisation in Monaco, or the IHO. And the IHO is there to ensure that the world's seas, oceans and navigable waters are properly surveyed and charted. And if you want to name something and name a feature, you have to go to Monaco and submit the forms to Monaco and say you found this ridge or fracture zone or whatever and you've given it a name. So, in terms of mapping the seafloor, this whole idea of finding a feature and looking at and understanding the deep sea in three dimensions, the charting of the seabed and all its bathymetric features was a discipline founded by another Scottish guy. He was born in Canada, but he was really an Edinburgh boy, and that was Sir John Murray, 1841 to 1914. It was this guy who documented the first systematic measurements of depth distribution and mean depth of the ocean, which he then calculated and produced the first hypsometric curve that began the process of mapping the oceans in three dimensions. So based on the available data of the day, he calculated the volume of the oceans, the volume of the continents above sea level, and bizarrely even the depth of a uniform ocean if the sea floor was level and no continents existed. So he was getting quite into it, right? And he was a forefather, if you will, of bathymetric data. He was also, of course, a key member of the Challenger expedition in 1872, which under the leadership of another great Scot, Charles Wyville Thompson, who was another Edinburgh boy, who went on to take the first sounding of what was later to be recognised as the Mariana Trench, hence we call it Challenger Deep. So he was also the first to note the existence of the Middle Atlantic Ridge, which is two pretty prominent features of the planet. Meanwhile, William Spears Bruce surveyed over 4,000 miles of Antarctica and published a very nice paper in Nature in 1911 all about Prince Albert's Oceanographic Institute. So it's all become, it's a small world here, right? Everyone seems to know everybody else and it's all sort of very much intertwined. Well, the Princess Alice found the first evidence of hail animals. It was the Challenger that equipped with 291 kilometres of Italian hemp rope for sounding wire. It unexpectedly recorded a depth of 4,500 fathoms in the northwest Pacific Ocean, southwest of the Man Island. So it was the first Challenger expedition that first got evidence that there was possibly something really deep which later became known as the Mariana Trench, but they kind of found this depth of 8,230 metres. The first measurement indicated the existence of an extraordinary deep area, and in due course led to the discovery of the Mariana Trench. But it wasn't the first challenger that discovered Challenger Deep. They just had one sounding that looked like there was something really big here. That accolade was from another Scottish guy, Rear Admiral Steve Ritchie, who in 1952 on the Challenger 2 expedition first mapped the Mariana Trench with an early echo sounder, and he found it to be 10,900 metres. So while Rear Admiral Steve Ritchie was born in England, he was of Scottish parents, and he lived in Colliston, north of Aberdeen, and I had the pleasure of going to one of his 90-somethings birthday party in his house, and when we first started doing the Hadle stuff, I even had the privilege of showing him the first Hadle videos we took in 2007. But unfortunately, he, he died in 2012. But prior to moving to Aberdeenshire, believe it or not, Steve Ritchie lived in Monaco, because he became the president of the International Hydrographic Bureau in Monaco, now the IHO, and he spent 10 years living in Monaco. And it gets weirder, in 2009 he donated his entire collection of the history of hydrography to Newcastle University, where we now work. So then, in the interest of tying together the scourge of marine plastics, Prince Albert I, Monaco, Scottish science heroes, Challenger expedition, deep sea trenches, recent expeditions, and tales from the high sea thrown in there, it gets even weirder. Are you still with me, Tom? I am, I am, I'm enthralled. Are you getting this? Are you getting how weird and complex this is? But kind of fascinating at the same time. Yeah, yeah, they all seem to know each other. Everything seems to be linked. We're finding that on the podcast anyway, like thematically things get What linked. we need now is a little bit of time travel and a bit of weirdness. Oh, now it gets weird. Yeah. So in June 2019, the Five Deeps expedition on the pressure drop pulls into Nuku Alofa, which is in the Kingdom of Tonga. The science party at that point was myself, Heather, Johanna, Cassie. And at that point, we'd been on the ship for well over a month, possibly five weeks, whatever. We'd done 20 landers in the Mariana and five sub-dives and nine landers across the trenches south of the Solomon Islands. So, and we also went on a wild goose chase looking for some potentially sunken fishing vessel that had gone down that night. Uh, and we mapped a crazy amount of seafloor all the way to Tonga. And we got to Tonga, we mapped the deepest point, and we discovered a new species in the Tonga Trench, and then we pulled into Nuka Alofa. But what was kind of weird was we pulled into Tonga on the exact berth that the Challenger expedition did in 1874, 145 years before us. So, feeling a bit exhausted with two days off, we decided to go and big hotel and get away from the ship for a while and drink rum around a swimming pool. And we went for a walk around town and, and the most conspicuous thing about Tonga that we noticed was there was nobody there. It was just empty. 
<laughs> were just like tumbleweeds. Completely, it seemed completely deserted. Everything was shut and it was a Sunday. Right, so we walked about a bit, we checked in a hotel, but before we left the ship, Heather had a copy of the Challenger Expedition book, so I just picked it up, stuck it in the bag, I thought, well, you know, if I get bored by the pool doing nothing, I'll maybe read this. So I eventually find myself in a sun lounge by a pool, with a beer and a book, and out of interest I looked up Tonga in the Challenger book to see what their experience was, and I had to chuckle when I read that on the 10th of July 1874, Challenger crossed the international dateline, arriving in Tonga on July 19th, and they said, and while a lot of locals canoed out to meet them, they would not trade as it was a Sunday. <laughs> so they had the same problem, they arrived on a Sunday. Essentially the Christian missionaries had arrived in Tonga 50 years beforehand. So don't, if you go to Tonga don't expect much to be going on on a Sunday. So anyway, we eventually hooked up with the rest of the crew at some point. We, I managed to FaceTime my son on his ninth birthday in the street in Tonga. Right, that's important, I'll come back to that later. Later that night I was still outside another bar with First Officer Fraser. He's been from Orkney, so for the sake of a good yarn I like to think that some of his ancestors picked up Prince Albert the First's balls from the, from the Gulf Stream, but... Who knows, I'm just making that up now. Suddenly there was this really awful smell of burning. We said to this guy, he's like, what, what, what on earth is that? You could see the smoke coming down the street. And the guy was just like, ah, oh, we're an island, so we just have to burn all our rubbish. Well, of course they do, right? Imagine a time-travelling scenario, right? This is where it gets weird. Imagine we jumped back in time, 145 years, and stood on that same quayside with Charles Wyville Thompson and John Murray, and let's, for fun, bring in the official chemist of the Challenger expedition. He was another Scottish guy called John Young Buchanan from Glasgow. John Young Buchanan, by the way, also went on to sail with Prince Albert I of Monaco post-Challenger, right? Keeping up? I am, I am. Imagine what the conversation could have been if we were stood there next to the guys on the Challenger explaining how things have changed and the legacy of what they did in the 145 years between, right? So we could say, lads, in a few months' time, you blokes are going to inadvertently find a spot south of the Mariana Islands, which is crazy deep, right? You're going to measure the depth of 4,500 fathoms. In 25 years from now, an American ship called USS Nero is going to follow you out and find that your measurement is part of a really big trench. And then the Japanese vessels, two of them, are going to come out 53 and 57 years later, and they're going to start realising that the Challenger Deep, as you call it in a couple of months' time, is actually this great big huge long trench, roughly the same volume as the entire Himalaya. And what's more, in 78 years from now, the HMS Challenger 2, with Scottish Steve Ritchie on board, who worked with Prince Albert I of Monaco, who they probably may have, may have known at that point, He's going to find that your super deep sounding of four and a half fathoms is only two thirds of the way down and it's actually closer to 6,000 fathoms and they're going to call it Challenger Deep. And not only will Prince Albert I of Monaco in 17 years from now find that species actually live in these trenches, we'll we'll soon know that they are full of a diverse community of species living all the way at the bottom. And then he'll become aware that Prince Albert I Monaco expedition the Hirondelle and Princess Alice found new types of crustaceans in the Atlantic that one day will eventually be given their names to the ones that we find in the Mariana Trench. Also, in 77 years from now, we'll call this whole trench a subduction trench, as it is the entire Pacific seafloor being pushed under the Philippine plate. And these fundamental principles of geology will build upon the very foundation of geology as a science established by another Edinburgh boy called James Hutton in the 18th century. And it expands on the geological principles of Earth's history that were, of course, established by Charles Lyell from Angus in Scotland. So you might want to write to him now, because in their time zone, he dies in about a year. As you look out over this glorious harbour of Nuku Alofa, picture, if you will, a thick smog of burning smoke descending over this beautiful town. Some of that will be from used car tyres, which in about 145 years from now, there will be 1.4 billion cars in the world, each with four pneumatic tyres. And those tyres were invented by a Scottish guy called Robert William Thompson from Stonehaven. <laughs> it was just 27 years ago in their time. But they may not have heard of them because they won't become practical for another 14 years where another Scottish guy called John Dunlop from Ayrshire in Scotland makes them better. And that burning monstrosity in your nostrils will also be from the burning of a thing we call plastic which is nearly developed in their time zone and it will start being mass produced properly in about 67 years after the Challenger expedition and that will replace a lot of their lovely glass and wood and brass and it will become a wonderful material but within a few decades it will start to find its way into the oceans cause incredible harm it will choke our fish our whales our birds our rivers coastline so on and so on and all those lovely species that are named after Prince Albert I of Monaco's ships that are now found in the massive big trench that they were to go on to discover will all end up full of plastic. So, speaking of Prince Albert I of Monaco, he will have a great grandson called His Serene Highness Prince Albert II of Monaco, who one day, about 145 years later, will spend an afternoon driving around the deepest place in the Mediterranean, enjoying the sad spectacle of nothing but plastic litter. And speaking of which, in 86 years from now, two guys are actually going to descend down to the bottom of that big Mariana trench in some mad device called the Triesta. And technically, a month ago, we did it another five times just for fun, and with a largely Scottish crew. Even me, a guy from Edinburgh, we went down to the bottom too. So they, that would probably blow their minds. But we can actually see more of that garbage. 
But all of the stuff we do, we film and we put it out there on television so that everyone around the world can see this in moving images. So speaking of film and TV, in about 54 years from now, John Logie Baird, who's the Scottish inventor from Helensburgh, is going to invent the television. And in my time, there are now 1.7 billion of them across the world. And these TVs allow us to show the bottom of the trench to millions of people all over the world. And in fact, right now, there is a guy in Edinburgh called Alexander Graham Bell, who in a couple of years is going to patent a thing called a telephone, which in my time, there are now 9.3 billion of them. And these phones mean you can talk in real time to anyone on the planet. So a bit like Alexander Bain from Caithness in Scotland's facsimile machine, which allows you to talk rather than just text, like his fax machine. But by combining these two Scottish inventions of phone and TV via a lot of transoceanic submarine cables that you Challenger boys have been laying the groundwork for, you can now talk to my son William face to face on his ninth birthday from the other side of the world in Tonga, even though he's 13 hours behind us on coordinated universal time, known as UTC, which was established in two years in your time by Sir Stanford Fleming of Kirkcaldy in Scotland. So speaking of which, remember Robert Sterling Newell from Dundee, Scotland. Not only is his submarine cable invention great, as you know, it will eventually allow this thing called the internet to spread around the planet. But from an immediate and practical point of view, you should also check out his wire rope idea and the machine he has for making it. It'll mean you can replace all that horrible hemp rope on the Challenger and it'll eventually become an every vessel for the next 120 years. And at the end of all this, if that isn't enough, we can introduce him to our team who at this point was halfway to mapping over a million square kilometres of the deepest sea floor in glorious three-dimensional Technicolor and with all that data will be submitted to the IHO in Monaco, copies of which sit on hard drives that fit into our pockets. And, and if that doesn't leave their heads exploding, I don't know what will. So while acknowledging there are glaring omissions in this whole story and probably plenty to tear it apart, but it's only intended as a yarn, and it's great fun to research, but I never even got time to build in other world-changing inventions like the refrigerator or the electric toaster or the vacuum flask or the lawnmower or the all-important flushing toilet. But there's a lot going on there, Tom. There sure was. Were we sponsored by the Scottish Tourism Board? Um, were you not telling me? Yeah. After doing that, it just seemed to come across more and more things that tie together Monaco, Challenger, Mariana, Scottish inventions. And, and I just I don't get how Scotland have managed to invent so many world-changing things. But they're all there. But I think it's really interesting if you to go back and ask some of these people. Where, you know, you guys are like a couple of decades away from the introduction of plastic on a grand scale. Well, now you're like top of Mount Everest, the bottom of Challenger, the South Pole, North Pole, everywhere you go. There's little fragments of this stuff. It makes sense now how things are, but I almost don't want to bash plastic as a material. It's perfect. It's, it's an incredible material. But the problem was we learned how to make it cheaper than everything else. And then we started using it where it wasn't appropriate. A single-use plastic should never exist. You shouldn't have a single-use thing that lasts for almost forever. But in terms of building material, medical devices, I think plastic's great as a material if properly applied. But I think we got almost a bit drunk on it. It, it became too cheap and easy to make. The guy in Australia, he always says that, you know, plastic is one of the greatest materials ever if it's kept within the economy. <laughs> but as soon as it crosses the line from the economy into the environment, then it becomes the worst material in the world. Yeah. And it's it's basically looking at big campaigns to make sure it never crosses that line. No one's saying stop using plastic. It's just if you use plastic, keep it. Keep it in the economy. Yeah. Keep it circulating around and don't just throw it away. And I don't buy into the, a lot of the banning of single-use plastics. I think that's a bit short-sighted. I think we should be looking at banning single-use plastics and pointless-use plastics. It doesn't matter if you use it twice, or three times, or four times. as if it never needed to be made in the first place. I've been thinking over the deep-sea mining episode, and I love, to, I love to ethically torment myself. I know that sounds a bit weird, but I feel it's a good way of of keeping yourself in check. It would make my life feel a lot easier if I could say, you know, I'm a deep sea biologist. I love the deep sea. I think it's great. So I'm against deep sea mining. And then I can kind of put up a bit of a, a defense, basically. So I can sort of galvanize myself in that way of thinking and protect myself from asking these questions. But I, I do want to do what's what's best. And I want to entertain any possible alternatives. So I, I used to work in marine survey where you, you sort of survey an area and you check that development isn't going to harm a protected seabed or isn't going to do excessive harm. But it's it's not about stopping it. It's about accepting that we needed oil rigs and we needed wind farms and we needed things to be built and doing them in the best possible way. And it, it used to be used to be my ethos really, good people in bad places. If you want to change something, don't wag the finger from the from the sidelines. Actually, get involved and try and sway it. And if you're just one person, you you might not be able to stop it. And to be honest, stopping it might not be the best thing. But you might be able to sway it. You might be able to make it a slightly lighter shade of grey. I suppose is the the way I'd think about it. But it does take a toll. I think uh, part of the reason I left is just that uh, I was getting burnt out by it. And if I was thicker skinned, I probably would have lasted a lot longer. 
I am passionate about conservation, but I'm maybe a bit strange in the ways I think about it. Uh, Alan has referred to me in the past as a as a man of great ethical contradiction, and I'm I'm incredibly frustrating about this stuff because it lo it looks insane from the outside. So as an example, going to my in-laws for Sunday lunch, they know I'm vegetarian, they make a huge effort, and they make me a lovely nut roast, and they have a roast chicken. And then at the end of the meal, they're throwing away the roast chicken. And like a crazy person, I then say, oh, don't, don't throw that away. I'll, I'll take that and I can make a stew out of that and I can eat, I can eat that for five days. It makes five meals. To me, <laughs> to me, that makes perfect sense because my goal is to reduce the sale of meat and to reduce the, the suffering and the damage done by the meat industry. I don't achieve my goals if that goes in the bin. That doesn't achieve anything. But I also understand <laughs> the look they gave me when they've gone to a huge amount of effort to make me a nut roast. So I'm really frustrating. I'm a horrible person to, to entertain. So I like to, I like to live in the gray. I don't think anything really is black and white. I think absolutes are sort of an extremist viewpoint, basically. And it's dividing the planet right now. I think we're, we're getting really polarized. So if anything seems a simple answer and anything seems good and bad, you probably don't have all the information or maybe you're protecting yourself from some difficult questions. So I try and ask those questions and, and I'm constantly self-criticizing and self-evaluating. A thing that's emerged for me at least is, is separating your personal identity from your goal and what you're trying to achieve. There was a, a study a while back talking about potentially allowing some hunting of old, unreproductive rhinos in order to protect other rhinos. And me, the individual, finds that sort of repulsive. But if my goal isn't about who I am and how I brand myself, but is about what I'm trying to achieve, which is to protect the rhinos, maybe I need to entertain that. And maybe I need to, to ask those difficult questions. It's just like the carbon capture. When that fella first got in touch with Alan, the gut instinct is, you know, you want to destroy a whole trench? You know, that's untenable. You can't do that. But then once you actually look what might be gained from that, climate change stands a good chance of, of wiping out the whole deep sea. And I think we need to also realise how just by existing, we're doing harm in, a, in certain ways. You're hearing the sound of my voice right now through internet cables, which are laid across the seabed. They're ploughed in by these enormous agricultural machines. The seabed is opened up, the cable is laid in, and then it's closed in after it. And they're regularly maintained. You know, if there's a fault in them, they're pulled up from the seabed and they're repaired and then put back down. They also wear out. Just by hearing the sound of my voice or signing a, a campaign against deep sea mining on the internet, you're passing through a cable that's already damaged some of the, the deep sea. And that's not to say that that's then an equivalency or anything like that, but I think we need to be aware of, of the damage that we do. Scientists do a lot of harm as well. A lot of samples are destructive and hopefully we, we do more good through that. For a vegetarian, I probably kill quite a lot of animals and I take that on board. I take the responsibility of that basically. And, and if somebody gets in touch with me, a little bit of hate mail saying, you know, how dare you do this? I'm almost encouraged by that because... This is an animal you wouldn't have even known about before, but now you're angry. You're angry that someone's hurt it. And I'm almost willing to be that bad guy because now you care about something that we didn't even know about. And if we were talking about filling a trench with liquid CO2, now we know what's living down there. I think one of the biggest problems with a polarised argument is no argument is polarised and there should never be a something as simple as two camps arguing over whether something is right or wrong because you always make the assumption that everyone in your camp thinks the same and is equally as right as you are. A couple of examples relating to human impacts that spring to mind is, I remember doing an interview and we we just filmed a beer can in Puerto Rico Trench and they wanted to do this interview about how disgusting this was and then a few months later they're making a documentary about how amazing and romantic the Titanic is. And I'm like, but no, animals don't care about metal. They don't care about the beer can. It just looks terrible. It's, you know, it's more of a sort of symbol of human folly rather than being an actual impact. But if you want to get upset about a beer can, what's the weight equivalent in the Titanic of beer cans? Surely it's got to be like millions, of, if not billions of beer cans worth. But we like that bit. We like almost like Titanic. And then there's a certain degree of, well, people died on it, so it's, it's, it's got so this emotional bubble around it. But you're like, well, not in the debris field, not with the big boilers. Why, why are we not ripping that out of the sea? If a beer can is bad, an oil drum's presumably bad, what size do you have to get to? Do, or does someone have to die in it before we decide that it's okay? Titanic is essentially litter. And then there's another one I was invited to some guy's talk recently, 
So I, I sort of sat in as a, as a guest and he was talking about deep sea and a bit of mining, a bit of, bit of this, that and the other. And there was a comment box at the side where people could leave questions. The question at the side was, uh, how are deep sea scientists going to mitigate against the negative impacts of deep sea tourism? And I thought, wow, one is deep sea scientists are not the police of the ocean. And what negative impacts from deep sea tourism? I just can't think of any. There's two points to make here. One is, if you look at the destruction of habitat left by scientists versus deep sea tourists, it's going to take deep sea tourists tens if not hundreds of years to catch up. The second thing is, why is it seen as a negative? Why, why, is, why is my mum not allowed to see a hydrothermal vent? Why not? We've touched on the impact that has on people. And just talking then with uh, Prince Albert of Monaco, he's no stranger to this. He set up an anti-plastic campaign in the Mediterranean, but he was still moved and impacted by the chance to go there and see firsthand. You know, fair enough, it wasn't directly scientific, but I think him having that dive had a huge impact and will continue to have a huge impact. And I can't think of how many other people will then be emotionally impacted by this as the deep sea stops becoming this strange and alien and unusual place and starts becoming like, no, this is this is part of my planet and I care about this. There's the power of the sub over an ROV in just the personal experience. And it's not just the person who does it because they tell stories and they share that emotion in ways that then radiates outwards. I think it should be encouraged to think the more humans go underwater, the better. Because then they might appreciate it more and might do something about it. My point is, once you go underwater, everything gets weirder, right? I'm not saying anyone's right or wrong in any of this. It's just that the, the conversation's automatically just pigeonhole. The, one of the things that bugs me the most about being at sea, it's one of the bugbear I've had for a long, long time, so let's just get it out, is this issue of shrinking polystyrene cups. I cannot stand it. Ah, and there's my number of scientists I've seen going, here's a big polystyrene cup, I've written my name on it, I've drawn a little picture, and look, it comes back all small. Two issues. One, a water column full of tiny little polystyrene microplastics you've just left as this thing's swinging around in some mesh bag on the back of a lander or a sub or whatever. And the second thing is, when was polystyrene ever held up as being a, a symbol of strength? <laughs> like, it squashed the poly... My four-year-old son can destroy a polystyrene cup in a matter of seconds. It's the most stupid, dumb thing I think I've ever seen, and it gets done all of the time. Every job I'm on, polystyrene comes out. And I've worked with a school teacher who was lecturing her children on human impacts of the sea, da 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 da, -da and she was away decorating cups. I said to her, like, I really wouldn't do that if I were you because you know the whole point is all these little bubbles collapse and it makes the cup look really small but then while it's swinging around in the bag it was almost certainly you're going to be depositing new microplastics into a pristine environment directly there within a matter of hours and she still took the souvenir over preventing more plastics in the sea. As soon as you go underwater nobody thinks straight anymore. This is not about bashing the community. This is just about we there are, is we no are the community. community as well. <laughs> I don't think I don't think there's an industrial community, a commercial, a public, a scientific community. There's just a whole bunch of people. Yeah. And some 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 people seem to have a good idea for some things. Some people have bad ideas for some things. I think as soon as you draw a line between scientists and non-scientists, and it all falls apart. There's a whole spectrum of those who are scientists. There's a whole spectrum to those who are public. There's a whole spectrum to those who work in industry. It's the pigeonholing and the polarization that irons out all those interesting nuances. So when I'm raking myself over the coals, morally dissecting myself, I need the guiding light of wisdom. I need the guiding light of someone who has apparently been everywhere and met everyone. Can I have a little bit of Don wisdom, please, about microplastics? To, to help me sleep at night and to know what we should do. Hello, my name is Don Walsh, and I'd like to offer some comment today about the plastic ocean. I think most of us have read about some of the, if you will, gross statistics about this mega problem uh, in the seas. Uh, Eight million tons per year of plastic uh, go into the ocean. And by uh, the year 2050, the bits of plastic, that is the mega plastics, the things we can see will outnumber fish. And also the more troubling problem of microplastics, those small bits that are almost invisible to the human eye. And it's been estimated that the number of microplastic bits in the sea exceeds the number of stars in our galaxy. That's trillions and trillions of bits of stuff that we can't even see with the naked eye. But they can see us because as fish ingest these micro bits uh, and we eat the fish, then these fibers migrate into our bodies. And basically, just about every human on our planet who has been exposed to uh, various forms of seafood has these plastic micro bits inside us. And if you don't eat seafood, you still cannot escape the problem because airborne bits of microplastics are ingested through our breathing 
and the foods that we eat here on land. Well, I've written extensively and lectured on the subject of the plastic ocean, so I respect the enormity of the issue, and I will not trivialize it here in just a few minutes to try and deal with the whole subject, which is beyond the time I have available. Instead, I'd like to give you a couple of examples of personal experience with my encounters in this whole area of plastic trash in the world ocean. During my naval career, I spent almost 15 years in uh, diesel-powered submarines. We had a device called a snorkel, which was essentially two pipes that stuck up through the surface of the ocean, one to take in air for the engines and the other for the engine exhaust. Our depth was usually about 58 feet below the surface, and so we had uh, in the conning tower an officer on watch on the periscope making sure that uh, we were clear of any traffic in the area so we could avoid collisions. However, that did not protect us from uh, certain bits of mega plastic, namely the extremely long drift nets that are used by fishermen. Sometimes these nets could be up to a mile long and they would just be launched by the fishing vessels and they would drift along passively catching the fish and uh, from time to time the fishing vessels would return and sort of reel in the nets and pick up their catch. I can remember on one occasion that when I had the periscope watch, I think we were operating off Japan at the time, when I looked out to my right about 90 degrees and I saw this line of floats on the surface of the ocean, very small glass ball floats. I spun the periscope around and looked 90 degrees to the left of our bow and there are more of those floats. And yes, that's what it was. We had been caught our electric, steel electric fish, a U.S. Navy submarine had been caught in a drift net. Fortunately, we were in a, an area where we could actually surface and cut away the net that was entangled with our superstructure. And then after that was done, we motored on uh, about our business. And this was not an isolated incident. Over my years in submarines, I heard many stories of submarines uh, being uh, caught in these large mega plastic drift nets in the world ocean. My second recollection or bit of history with took place in Paris in year 2001. I was there at a ceremony and one of my fellow awardees was uh, Thor Heyerdahl, who in 1947 had sailed across the Atlantic on his Contiki raft. And one of the things that we were asked by the sponsors of this uh, award event was that each of us would bring to the event some item that was part of our particular exploration work. Thor Heyerdahl uh, had his pencil written log of the Contiki and that was quite a, a uh, wonderful experience for me to hold that in my hand and to uh, be able to visit with him. And I asked him about his crossing of the ocean and what uh, what was one of the singular, most singular things that impressed him. And his answer was seeing all of that garbage in the ocean, most of which was plastic. So even back in the late 1940s, we could see the plastic ocean as it was being formed. And remember, plastics are a more recent thing. I would guess that the extensive or universal use of plastics globally, worldwide, if you will, only began about six or seven decades ago. It's a relatively new thing. It was a very popular material because it was easy to fabricate, it was cheap, and it could be used in so many different applications. But on the downside, of course, is what we've got today is a world full of material that is very hard to recycle or even destroy. And it reminds me of the uh, marketing slogan used by the De Beers Diamond Cartel. Diamonds are forever, and that's the case with plastics today in our world. Plastics seem to be forever. So have a care in your own personal life. Try to reduce use of plastics. Only use those that are fully biodegradable and out in nature and otherwise use other materials such as paper which was perfectly adequate for hundreds of years for our daily use and we can all do a bit to help make our, our world a cleaner, safer for all of us. Thank you. And that concludes this episode of the Deep Sea Podcast. Thank you for joining us. Welcome to 
2021. I hope this year will be a little bit brighter for all of us. I hope you're all doing okay. As ever, you can email us to chat about the podcast or pose us any questions. You can email us on podcast at armatasoceanic.com and I'll put that in the show notes as well. I'll also throw in some links to some open access papers if you'd like to read the science behind a few of the things we've been talking about today. We'll deep see you next time. The Deep Sea Podcast is supported by our company Armatus Oceanic. If you would like to explore the Deep Sea yourself, we can provide technology and know-how to allow you to do that. But if you'd like to bring the Deep Sea to your audience, we can also support you with fact-checking, storytelling, and presentations. We want the Deep Sea to be accessible to everyone. Hey, hey kids, you in the market for some tiny styrofoam cups? Check out these bad boys. I've been to over 2,000 meters. Look at how small they are. They're completely useless. Huh? Not enough for you. I see you know your tiny styrofoam cups. How about these? 4,000 meters. That's real abyssal tiny cup right there. That's good stuff. Or do you want something really special? Now they don't come cheap, but I just got in some Hadel tiny cups. 7,000 meters. That's the best of the best. That's the tiniest of the tiny cups. Just look at that. Smaller than a shot glass. They're completely useless. Best tiny styrofoam cups money can buy. Oh, jeez, it's Attenborough. Right, play cool, play cool. Don't look.